So it really was just the microphone, um, not plugged in or not turned on actually, but uh, it's ready now. So welcome to Gorilla Physics, I'm Kit Burst Masters, and today I've got all of the Edexcel core practicals for you. <laughs> so welcome, I hope this is going to be really, really useful to you. Um, Tolfo's been having a chat on um, the way into this feed, and he's made a really good point don't rush it, you know, make sure you take your time and go through all of the different things. I'm going to try my best to cover all 16 core practicals for Edexcel in this live feed in about an hour. But um, the reality is that maybe to do that in detail, it might take a bit longer than that. So I might take a break and then come back. But tonight I'm going to cover all 16 Edexcel core practicals. If you don't do Edexcel, stick around. If you do GCSE, stick around because it's all very relevant to you. And I'm going to explain why that is because, in fact, um, the government the sets the qca they set the apparatus and techniques that they want you to cover at gcse and a level and they are the same for all different exam boards so this stuff all of this information that i'm going to give you today is relevant to all different exam boards i'm just using the 16 edexcel core practicals to cover the, those apparatus and techniques essentially the exam boards have written core practicals or required practicals whatever they're calling them so that they can cover those techniques okay so um very warm welcome to you all. I'm going to go across to the visualizer in a moment and we're just going to get started with the core practical stuff. Can you just give me some likes and some thumbs up? Let me know that this is going well for you and you can hear me loud and clear. You can see everything and um, it's going well. Can you hit the like button? That would be really, really useful to you. If you're watching, um, if you're watching recorded, then you probably need to sub up and make sure you've got notifications ready to go. And um, if you're in AS, this is going to be useful to you. If, in, if you're in GCC, this is useful to you. I'm just going to quickly go through what's coming up in the next few days on my channel in terms of live feeds, because it's all preparing for that. Um, Monday is going to be the first A-level exam, and next week is going to be, after that, will be the, the GCC exams, and I'm going to be doing live feeds to help you prepare for those. So um, stay tuned for this. <laughs> So this week coming up, we've got uh, today all, all of the LXL practicals, and on Friday, that's tomorrow, I'm going to go through some decoding some of the uh, written, longer written questions, because that has been requested quite a lot, actually, people were wanting, how do you decode a question to figure out what the clues are telling you, so I'm going to go through that, and I'm going to be talking about some examiner's reports uh, and some exemplars of student responses and why they didn't get full marks. That's going to be a really useful session tomorrow for you. Okay. Um, also, some really hardest, some of the hardest questions. And on Sunday, just before the exam, I'm going to do some uh, Q and A sessions. So jump in to get some uh, to watch the Q and A's. I'm going to put all that in the description. Also, all of the stuff that I go through here today, I'm going to put onto the web, my website, and I'll mention that in a subsequent live feed and give you a link to that. I'd hope to get it done for today, but you know, things conspired to me. And I was a bit more rushed than I wanted to be starting this live feed. Right, without further ado, we're going to go into the visualizer now and I'm going to talk you through all of those uh, core practicals here. So, first of all, this is just to say these are the apparatus and techniques coming your way, okay? Everybody needs to do 12 core practicals, okay? But that's to get that common practical assessment, um, that CPAC uh, separate qualification. But in the exams, you need to know all of the core practicals because they're going to ask you questions on them. So that's what today is all about, right, is knowing all of those core practicals. And here's the first one, okay, use appropriate analog apparatus to record a range of measurements. Okay, so they, they actually need you to use analog uh, apparatus and this point interpolate between scale markings. These bits, these apparatus and techniques, they are common to all exam boards. Everyone needs to be able to do that. Use digital in instruments including multimeters, range of measurements, okay, to include all these different things. So you need to be able to decide and use digital instruments and analog ones. You need to know about methods to increase the accuracy of measurements, such as timing over multiple oscillations and use of fiducial markers, uh, set square or a plumb line. And all these you'll see as we go through the core practicals. You will see how these come out and when they're useful and why they're useful. Okay. Next one. I'll just say as well, I will dump into the chat 
at various points. I'll probably do four at a time maybe and then have a little look at the chat. Uh, use stopwatch or light gates and it implies comparison between those two things and again you're going to see how they they play out in these core practicals. These are the same for every exam board so if you're asking for different exam boards then um, think about this as being useful for all different exam boards as well. Use calipers and micrometers so there are different techniques for very small differences okay how do we use them? Using digital or vernier scales, that's the sliding scale, digital scales for these things is easy, but the vernier scale, you need to be able to interpolate the scale markings for those. Uh, correctly construct circuits from circuit diagrams using DC power supplies. So do you understand you, your circuit diagrams? Use a range of circuit components, including those where polarity is important, i.e. diode. And design and construct and check circuits using these things. So how would you actually check a circuit using um, multimeters and things like that? Use of a signal generator and oscilloscope, including volts per division and time base. So how you change those to get greater ag accuracy on an oscilloscope. I'm sure you'll think of practicals where you've had to use oscilloscopes, either digital or analog, but you've had to use them. Okay, and they can ask you questions about these things in the exam, and they will do. Generate and measure waves. Okay, how, what are those practicals where you're using waves? Maybe mic sound waves. Okay, or waves in a ripple tank, or actually vibration generators, waves on a string, microwave and radio wave sources. Okay. Blank page in between each of these which I've accidentally printed off. Um, use a laser light source to investigate characteristics of light including interference patterns and diffraction. So that's that young double slit practical that we're going to go into or just diffraction grating practical as we've called it. Using ICT such as computer modeling and data loggers. Why would you use them at different points? A variety of sensors. Okay, using software to process data. So they actually like to chuck in a kind of spreadsheet question sometimes in exams. And lastly, using ionizing radiation and importantly safety with that, including the detectors. And they want you as students to be able to use the ionizing radiation um, safely. Okay, hope that's okay. Do give me a little um, thumbs up, give me some likes. Okay, there's some nice comments already. I'm going to go through into the first of the core practicals now, G by 3, 4, okay. Share this thing out. If you want it to go viral, dudes, then share this thing out, okay. Let's take a moment to share this thing out, okay. Tell your friends. Right, okay, here's um, G by 3, 4. Essentially, you've got to drop a thing, you've got to measure distance and time, and you've got to use a SUVAT equation to work out G, okay, plot a graph. Now, there's two kind of methods, the trapdoor and the light gates method. Now, this is the one that I found most accurate. You have a, a track, and you have a light gate at the bottom, and you drop some dowel, okay, and you measure the distance S, and you don't measure the time, but you measure V there, and you use the equation V equals U, uh, V squared is U squared plus 2AS, knowing that U is zero, um, because it starts from zero, and you measure the S there, and then you rearrange that, manipulate that, to get yourself a graph where G is the gradient. So what would that look like? That would be V squared, no, it wouldn't, it would be 2S over V squared, yep. Um, this is how we turn this thing into the form Y equals MX plus C. Okay, Y on um, is 2S, V squared is X, and A is G, is the gradient, okay. So, um, what types of things will they ask you to do with this one? Well, they might ask you to just discuss improvements using percentage uncertainty. So, for example, the very small percentage uncertainty using light gate versus time with the stopwatch. You can, of course, measure gravitational acceleration just with the stopwatch. Exactly the same things, okay? You wouldn't be able to use this one. If you wanted to just use a stopwatch, you'd have to use S equals UT plus a half AT squared, okay? Um, and you would work. Okay, but the percentage error in timing would be very very large compared to using the um, light gates. Okay, uh, this one importantly involves you comparing your final result, whatever you get as your gradient here, with the accepted value of G and stating that as a percentage difference. That's a really important core skill in all the core practicals, talking about the percentage difference. Okay, next one. Understand the systematic error caused by air resistance. So almost all the time when you do this practical, you're going to have a systematic error and your measured G is going to be slightly lower. And that's an important statement to make. It's going to be lower than the accepted value, lower than the true value. When you have a systematic error, it affects all the whole results in a certain way. Okay, so that's a, an important thing there. 
make sure you're able to resolve algebra. Now, it's not the only way you can do this, okay? The trapdoor method also involves using s equals ut plus a half at squared. And the trapdoor method is simply basically you've got a circuit at the top with an electromagnet, okay, which drops a ball and you've got a little trapdoor at the bottom, which when that moves, okay, when the ball hits that, it breaks a circuit and it stops the timer. So you start the timer when you turn off a circuit at the top and the ball drops, breaks the circuit at the bottom and that stops the timer. Now actually that is using this equation here rather than v squared is u squared plus 2as and um, that means that you've got to have a different resolution into y equals mx plus c but make sure you can do that. So much of this core practical stuff involves you actually taking a bit of algebra and resolving it into y equals mx plus c so that you can plot a straight line graph and put your result onto the graph. Okay. So that's what I mean by the usefulness of a gradient as a average, okay? It takes less account of anomalies. If we do the arithmetic mean, then unfortunately you get this kind of, this, these anomalies which are not very, um, oh, sorry, which skew your final result. Whereas if you just go with, if you just go with a gradient, then the line of best fit takes less account of those anomalies. So it's like a graphical average, it's more useful, it's more accurate. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you? If you have an anomaly over here, now you can clearly see the gradient is still gonna be this line here, but this one we ignore when we apply our line of best fit. But if we work these things out and get a G from each of these values, then do an arithmetic mean, this one has a large effect on that mean. Okay, hope that makes sense. On to the next one, okay, that was number one. On to number two then. random on a blank page in between every single one. So this is number two, resistivity of a metal. And this is from the equation R equals rho L over A. Okay, so this is our equation here. And we want to measure this thing, rho the resistivity. So what you do is you measure the resistance of various lengths of wire, so you vary L basically, and you measure the diameter of the wire to allow you to calculate A. You use an equation to find the resistivity. You can actually put that on a gradient, and you probably should. You can probably see that straight away if I just make R Y and I make um, L over A my X variable then rho will be my gradient, okay? So, um, I've, I've not done that hugely well there, have I? So, I treat it like this, and I say r is y, rho is the gradient, and l over a is the x variable. Okay, so we plot that, we'll get a straight line with the resistivity being the gradient. So, what do we have? r there and L over A there, giving us rho as the gradient. So there's loads of different methods you can use here. You can actually use an ohm meter, so a multimeter set on ohm meter setting, or you can use a voltmeter and ammeter. They're both completely valid, but here you have to pass a current through here. So there's this issue of actually putting a current through the wire, causing a heating effect and changing the resistance. And that will have a larger effect on the lower, um, the lower lengths of wire because the current will be larger. Okay. The, in, whenever we're using a multimeter, remember that we've got a variable resolution, so we can actually change the resolution of the multimeter, and you're always trying to work to three significant figures. Okay, so what I've just talked about is taking the account of potential systematic error by heating using the current through the wire. So if you keep currents low as possible, okay, then you're going to have a less heating effect, and that is going to lead to a greater accuracy. So considering what kind of systematic errors you might have in your practical is a really important thing. Now in this practical, you, there is a non-zero resistance in the circuit, okay? We, we model um, circuits as being having negligible resistance, but in this case, and in all cases really, they do have a slight resistance, but that's gonna cause a systematic error, which is just gonna shift the graph up, so it doesn't affect the gradient. So essentially, in practice, your graph is gonna look something like this, where this value here, this y-intercept, is actually the kind of internal resistance of everything, the, the resistance of the rest of the circuit, but it won't affect the gradient, which is the resistivity of the wire. So it's a very important idea, this idea of systematic errors, we can account for them, and we can just, if we do them in the right place in our algebra, then we can just leave them on a graph and the gradient won't be affected. Okay, um, this is a really important one. Whenever you've got a random uncertainty, okay, for example, using this micrometer to measure the diameter and hence get the area, then you measure into this tiny, um, tiny uncertainty, okay, this tiny, this really high resolution, 
um, but you need to still take multiple readings at different positions and discard anomalies and take an average. Okay, now this is normally going to be greater than five readings at different positions, discarding the anomalies and taking an average. This is a normal technique for a random error. Okay, to find resistivity of non-metals, you need a much larger area and a shorter length of wire. So they could talk about this practical and say, well, how would you do this with a non-metal? Now I use conducting putty, and you need to in the lab, and you need to, like penny pieces like this, and you have really long tubes of the things. Okay, it's kind of like a centimeter, two centimeters diameter, and only like five centimeters like length. And that's because it's got a lower resistivity, so having a measurable resistance, one that's going to have a low percentage error because it's a large enough resistance, then you need to have um, larger area and shorter lengths. That's not really... Uh, okay, so make sure that you understand when you've got something that you're expecting to have a difference, that your method change accounts for what that difference is going to be. Okay, much lower resistance, uh, much higher resistivity meaning that you're going to have to make sure that you've got a larger area, a shorter thing, so you can actually get a current through it and you can actually accurately measure the resistance. Okay, next one. This one is EMF and internal resistance. Okay, so we set up a circuit where we're modeling an internal resistance. This is the third one. And the circuit diagram is going to look something like this. You take a normal dry cell and you have a fixed resistor. I think we normally use a 10 ohm resistor. And that is your um, your kind of model of a power supply. Okay, so we say that 10 ohms, that's going to be our internal resistance. Now, it would work if we had something that we wanted to measure the internal resistance of, but the internal resistance of dry cells is so low that we won't get any accuracy that way. And then you have a variable resistor, okay, and you measure the voltage across that and the current through it and uh, you just vary this, basically measure voltage and current, and then you're going to manipulate the algebra to get the gradient. Now this is actually just an expansion of Ohm's law, okay, where the EMF, which is the actual kind of supply, if it was an open circuit, it wasn't plugged in, would be equal to the current times the load resistance, which is this resistance that we are varying here, plus the current times the internal resistance, which is this little resistor here. Okay, now I've got a full video where I actually demonstrate this and go through this, okay? But if we think about this, this practical here, if we make this um, y, so i r, that's the y variable, equals the emf minus i little r, then we get c um, minus m, which is uh, little r, times x, which is i. I've done those the wrong way around, but essentially the graph comes out like this, with our uh, our terminal potential difference, that's the voltmeter reading, load resistance on the um, sorry current here on the x-axis, and we get this line here with a gradient of minus r. And little r is what we're after. Okay, and the y-intercept is the EMF there. Okay, now I hope you'll get that again. I've got a full video where I go through that one. So uh, we we're going to model wires in and other circuit components is having negligible resistance in a circuit. So there's something you need to remember about any kind of circuit, then you think about everything else as having no resistance at all. So it doesn't matter whether I connect this really, this voltmeter across here, or directly across the cell kind of apparatus, because the, the terminal PD will be the same across those points there. That's what we're comparing. We're comparing the EMF of the cell and the terminal potential difference. Okay, and someone when something is negligible, it means it's too, it's much smaller than the other values and too small to bother considering. Okay, an ammeter has a near zero resistance, okay, it needs to be connected in series, so you need to know how to connect up and why they're connected up in this way. How to connect up an ammeter, it's in series because it's a ze near zero resistance, so it basically doesn't affect the current and it needs to measure the current through it. A voltmeter has a very large resistance, okay, so it needs to be connected in parallel because you don't want any current to actually go that way. It needs to be connected in parallel with something because it is measuring the difference between the potentials at the two points. All right, uh, moving on. Um, neither of the meters should af have um, affect the current in the series loop. Okay, lastly, we need to use a fixed resistor 
to model the internal resistance because the internal resistance of a normal chemical cell is very low and be hard to measure accurately. They keep them as low as possible to make them as efficient as possible, basically. All right, we don't want much heat dissipated in the thing. So next one, falling ball viscometer. And I'll, I'll have a little look at your chat there. So if there's anything that you're kind of asking about, then I'll have a look at the chat after this one. Okay, so essentially this one is drop a ball through some fluid. Again, I normally use a measuring cylinder, drop a ball, and you I use some elastic bands at some various points, okay, and just try and measure the time of transit of the ball between this point and between this point, okay, and that's the difficult thing to do accurately, and then hopefully if you find that they're the same, you can say that's terminal velocity, and you can use your equation uh, for terminal velocity to uh, calculate uh, viscosity, okay, so essentially that's by considering weight, up thrust, and Stokes force to calculate the viscosity. So you, remember in this case you can't use light gates to measure the time accurately because the liquid is just going to block the beam. Okay, so the really important point about core practicals is relate your improvements to the method. So don't just reel off a stock phrase, use a light gate to do timing. Okay, it wouldn't work in this case, so you're not going to get a mark for that. So relate your improvements to the method. Um, it works best in this case with smaller balls and more viscous fluids as they're going to fall slower which is kind of like the smaller ball falling slower is counterintuitive but it is the case. Okay, um, this is the point, Okay, you can always try and increase the values of readings to reduce the percentage uncertainty and that, they're driving at that a lot in core practicals. How are you going to reduce the percentage uncertainty in what you're measuring? Okay, you could also consider using video analysis, and that's what I normally end up doing, especially with the larger ball bearings. I normally go for some kind of video analysis, slow but slow motion playback, uh, frame by frame playback, some statement like that to reduce the percentage uncertainty in that way to get more accurate measurement of timing. Okay, Stokes law is a model of a perfectly spherical object. Okay, and doesn't consider the extra drag with being near to the edge of the measuring cylinder. So actually, this works bet better if we have a really wide tank of water compared to the size of the of the ball, because you get like extra drag due to friction. Basically, the flow rate is less towards the side of the measuring cylinder. So that's an issue, especially with the larger of the ball bearings falling through these things. And then lastly, in this one, they're driving at this idea of considering uncertainties in an experiment, comparing uncertainties of different measurements, okay? And whenever you compare uncertainties of different measurements, so like what is the larger uncertainty? Is it is it timing or is it distance in this case? Well, you have to compare them as percentage uncertainties, not absolute uncertainties, because they're different quantities, okay? So always be thinking percentage uncertainty to make a comparison. Right, I'm gonna just pause, I think, um, just to catch my breath and just have a quick look through the chat. If there's anything that you've got and then we'll crack on with this one, number five, which is the young modulus of copper. <laughs> yeah, there's loads of people uh, here chatting, which is really nice to see, I must admit. Okay, so um, good to see you all. Yeah, there's loads of little, there's loads of really good things. You're all talking to each other. Yep. Yeah, just make sure you're um, manipulating the algebra correctly. I think that you're capable of doing the algebra. This is more really, I'm going for the improvements, okay? Because if you memorize the kind of improvements for these um, core practicals, you're gonna know the improvements for the whole range, okay? So this is the same for every exam board, okay? The improvements for these core practicals, the improvements of timing, for example, measurements of distance, okay? Those are the same throughout every single exam board. So this is what we're driving at in this video. If I, get, if I make mistakes in the algebra, then just let me know. Okay, but I'm just doing that off the cuff at the minute. Yeah, is an ohmmeter more accurate than, than a voltmeter or an ammeter? Well, it just depends on whether you're having a heating effect large enough and the accuracy of those individual things. I would say that possibly if you're using an ohmmeter, then you've just got one reading, and so you're not having this compounded com uh, error. Okay, so when, you, when, you're, when you're calculating resistance from V over I, then you've got an error, you've got an uncertainty in V and uncertainty in I, and the uncertainty in R is the sum of the percentage uncertainty of those two things. So I would make sure that, that, that um, you know, that's the point there. If you're reading two things and then using them to 
calculate another one, then you actually have to add the percentage uncertainties. But if you just measure one thing directly, it should be more accurate. Okay, with the ohm meter as well, the important thing is you can vary that scale. Okay, so you can vary the scale, so you can always get yourself three significant figures. Yeah, it's all about using getting those straight lines. Absolutely. Uh, really good. This video going out on people's group chats, that's awesome. Okay, I'm cracking on in another few minutes or another 30 seconds or so. So if you want to get your group chat and just ping this video out to your mates, that would be great. Um, some people are talking about money and things like that. There's, if you wanted to um, donate, you can always do the super chat on here. Don't, don't stress out about money or anything like that. That's not why I'm in it. But um, also, I do have a Patreon account if you're interested. And what I'm trying to create there is just a kind of um, small group of people that I can ask about. Tofo, is this kind of is this working for you? Tofo, sorry, is this working for you? Is this what you expected? Um, yeah, there is. Yeah, there's this like the magnetic one. Okay, is not a very great method because the it takes a moment to demagnetize the magnet. Okay, and sometimes when you turn it off, it doesn't even fall at all, and you're waiting. So that is not going to be an accurate measurement of timing if it's actually got a slight delay to fall. Yeah, right at the end, I'm going to talk about devising a practical, okay? And it, yeah, it's always going to be based on the apparatus and techniques that are covered by the core practical. So if you learn the core practicals, the apparatus and techniques in there, then you can devise any experiment they're asking you to. You just need to kind of pick from this kind of menu of um, core practical, like, points, uh, methods, apparatus, techniques that you've used already to solve their question. So I'll talk about that just at the end. Um, as I said before, this video, yeah, this video will be available later for you to look back through. Absolutely, um, good if you stop this here though, because you can ask questions about it. Um, but you can do that. And uh, the last thing was, yeah, uh, exam boards. Again, this is relevant to all exam boards because the apparatus and technique is the same throughout all the exam boards. Okay, I went through that at the start. All right, so back into the visualizer now. Back into. Um, it's <laughs> called five young modulus of copper. So young modulus. Well, let's just start. When you're designing one, okay, the normal things to do is to start with what the actual uh, equation is: stress over strain. Okay, so what you do is you plot a stress over strain graph. Okay, and the gradient of that is the young modulus. So what is stress? Is force over area, and what is strain? It's the extension over the original length. So you need to measure all of these things essentially. You need to measure a force, you need to measure an area, you need to measure an extension, you need to measure an original length. Okay, so that's how you do this practical. Now, normally, you need to use a very long wire to allow the extension to be large enough to be measured accurately. Okay, so you can use a vernier scale, but normally, if we get the wire that a piece of copper that is bigger than two meters. And the way we normally do this is just to get a desk or a series of desks, really. <laughs> okay, and actually have a wire stretched from a fixed point at one end with a pulley at the other end, I've drawn that terribly, okay, with some slotted masses that we can increase, okay, 100 grams at a time, a newton at a time, basically. And we use a little marker, okay, and a fixed meter ruler. Okay, so we can measure the delta x as the wire kind of creeps here. Okay, remember if you do this though, the original length is this length, not the entire length to the end of the, the thing there. Okay, so I hope that makes sense there. Um, we, yeah, that's so vernier scales, we can measure very small extensions with a lower percentage uncertainty there. Remember, this percentage uncertainty in the extension is likely to be very large. That's out of all of these measurements, is going to be the largest uncertainty. Um, again, we've got a random error when we measure the diameter. So what we do is we measure the diameter twice at each point, and we do it at right angles to each other. So if we've got a piece of wire like this, it might not be perfectly spherical, and that's why you measure at right angles. You measure this diameter, and then you measure this diameter. Okay, and you do that five times along the length of the wire, okay, and average all of those 10 results to get you a um, more accurate average of that diameter. So remember, repetition helps you with random uncertainty, random errors. Okay, we always give our final results the same number of significant figures, uh, the least number of significant figures that we measured to. So just think about that. Make sure that they often ask you to evaluate someone's results, what they've done wrong with their results, and they're often going to be looking for those points about significant figures. Okay, next one.
uh, speed of sound okay so speed of sound I really like this practical okay basically you have uh, an oscilloscope okay which is hooked to a signal generator okay this is my signal generator just here and that is hooked to a loudspeaker okay which is giving out a sound wave okay I know sound waves are um, are longitudinal but I think it's useful to, to think about where those peaks and troughs are, those high pressure and low pressure, so compression, refraction. Okay, and you move a microphone actually through this and that's connected to the same oscilloscope and that you compare um, each trace you basically allow, you, as you move the microscope through this point you're looking for the points where the two traces are in phase and when they're out of phase. Okay, So when you find exactly where the two waves are in phase then you've basically got a whole wavelength, so if I'm at this point here, a whole wavelength um, of that sound wave. And then you use um, you use that with along with the blah 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 along with the frequency that you've measured from your oscilloscope and the wave speed equation, V equals F lambda to work out the wave speed. Now it's pretty accurate, it's pretty darn accurate, okay? So um, it works really, really well, especially if you've got a loud enough sound and you can put up with a loud enough sound to actually um, to, to measure those accurately because as you get further away obviously the microphone trace gets quite a low amplitude okay so that's what I've said here and the microphone signal is not a very high quality signal it's not as clear it's not as um, narrow as a beam if you like on the oscilloscope to uh, as the the original um, AC trace producing the sound so it's hard to tell exactly where they're in phase, this is quite an important thing but what we can do is we can always adjust the time base on the oscilloscope, that's a really important thing, if we adjust the time base when we're measuring the frequency we can get a much more accurate um, frequency, a much more precise frequency we might say so that again is about reducing the percentage uncertainty so if you're seeing this on your oscilloscope then you need to change the time base so you're seeing this so you can just measure the time period um, as accurately as possible to give you as accurate as possible frequency there. So this is about ways to reduce the percentage uncertainty. Again, that is the key thing. Most of these core practicals, most of these evaluative points are about reducing the percentage uncertainty. So basically, every point where the two waves are in phase, we travel one wavelength. So we can repeat that through that same wave. Um, make sure you use a fixed ruler and a set square. That's a technique for using the analog instrument to measure the, the length in this case. Okay, that will that's the technique that you need to memorize, that's the technique they're gonna be looking at if they ask you to suggest an improvement, for example. Um, this will accurately measure the points of one wavelength path difference. Okay, the frequency chosen needs to give a wavelength in the region of ten centimeters. So they might ask you what's a suitable frequency. So you need to think about what you know roughly V for um, sound is going to be 330 meters per second. Okay, it's actually when I've measured it in my lab, it normally comes out 343, which is the speed of sound at 20 degrees, but there we go. Um, and with that, and with a frequency that you set, you need to work out a wavelength in the region of 10 centimeters okay don't have to be 10 centimeters it can be 5 it can be 50 but whatever you think that you can measure accurately with the meter ruler okay is the um, wavelength to choose so you set your frequency based on an accurately measurable wavelength hope that makes sense let me know if it does or doesn't um, Okay, that, and that's that. And again, it's about reducing the percentage uncertainty. So if you use a meter ruler with a one millimeter um, scale, then you percent and you measure ten centimeters, then your percentage uncertainty. I've done this wrong, haven't I? One millimeter, and you measure something ten centimeters, then your percentage uncertainty is going to be about one percent. All right, so that is low enough. Okay, you were looking for something below five percent, below two percent, maybe as a good enough percentage uncertainty in the lab. hope that all makes sense. It's a good practical. It's all about the practical apparatus and techniques and how you use them. Okay, mass per unit length. I think we're on number seven a minute. And I'll take a little break and look for your chat at eight. Okay, this is a um, Meld's apparatus. So again, you have the oscilloscope and you have the, vib um, you have the signal generator and you have a vibration generator. Okay, with a string attached normally by a pulley with some masses to give you a tension in the string. Okay, this is all clamped obviously down to the bench. And basically you vary the frequency until you have standing waves. 
Okay, so this will be the second kind of um, harmonic uh, frequency, double the the uh, natural frequency. You basically find resonant frequencies of this string and measure the wavelength of these. So in this case, the wavelength would be the entire length of the string. You change it again until you've got um, uh, three antinodes, okay, and then you measure the wavelength of that and the frequency at that point, okay, and hopefully then you're going to get a graph. And um, in this case, think about what your your largest source of uncertainty is going to be. The frequency uncertainty is going to be quite low if you use the oscilloscope to measure it, but if you just read it directly off the signal generator, it's going to be a high uncertainty. You have to trust whether it's calibrated correctly or not. Wavelength is going to have a high uncertainty, though, because it's very difficult to find this node exactly. Okay, so there tends to be quite a thick blur on the thing. And then this is all about, again, deciding which independent variables and dependent variables to use because there are different ways to actually do this. So I'm going to get the equation for this one now from the formula sheet. It's this one here. V is root uh, T over mu. Okay, where T is the tension and mu is the mass per unit length. Now, there's loads that you can do with this because you don't have to necessarily vary the same thing. So it's about deciding what independent variables and what dependent variable you're going to use, what you're going to vary and what you're going to measure. What I normally do is I um, fix the tension and I vary the frequency and measure all the wavelengths. Okay, so I find those points there. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only thing I can do because you could uh, vary the tension and find just one antinode um, each time and get a graph or with uh, mu as being your gradient um, by just fixing the other variables okay so let's just manipulate the algebra to get a line of best fit and from that we'll decide so remember the other thing we know about v is v is f lambda okay so f lambda equals the root of the tension over the mass per unit length uh, square both sides Okay, so if we want to vary t, then we've straight away we've already got a y equals mx plus c. If we leave that as y, okay, whatever that value comes out and we vary the tension, then uh, the tension is going to be the x-axis, okay, and 1 over mu is going to be the gradient. So this becomes m and this becomes x. Okay, we can obviously invert that. Um, and we'd have a graph where I've continued, you didn't see all that, so I'll, I'll start this a little bit again. So I've got this this expression here. I can call this my y term, and then t is my x term, and one over mu is my gradient. Okay, I can obviously flip these around and just get mu as my gradient. But the other one, the other way we can do this is we can uh, make lambda being our x variable, okay, and t as being our fixed variable, one of our control variables, and we can still force that to be y equals m, 1 over mu in this case, uh, x t over lambda squared. Okay, so it depends how we want to do this, but we can still find a way to get a straight line through the origin or with a plus c, if it was the case of the plus c, and we'd uh, we'd have one over mu as being our gradient, and that would be our target there. Okay, so again, I've got a video on this one where I do this algebra just a little bit better anyway. So other points about this: it's difficult to find points of resonance. Okay, what you do when you're looking for this resonance is you move slightly above it and slightly below it in terms of the frequency, and you find the point where you think you get the sharpest node or the highest amplitude. Highest amplitude being the maximum kind of resonance. And this technique is really useful to us if we want to measure the speed of light or standing waves with lasers, and they're used to measure very small distances. Lasers is how we manufacture very, very tiny, tiny things. Okay, uh, diffraction grating and interference patterns. And again, this starts from the algebra. So this is the algebra n lambda equals d sine theta. Okay, and what you have is a laser through a diffraction grating. So here's my diffraction grating. Here's my laser light. Okay, and that's going to basically have points of zero path difference, points of one lambda path difference to be the first maxima, points of two lambda path difference to be the second maximums, and so on and so forth. And what we do is we measure those differences there, and we measure the distance from the wall. It's a terribly drawn diagram. 
apologies there, this will be the separation x, and we use trig to work out the angle, okay, for each order, n is the order, so this is the first order maximum, this will be the second order maximum, and d is the separation between the slits there, so it's allowing us to work out the wavelength of laser light, and it's pretty darn accurate, okay. Why is it lasers that we use? Because they're monochromatic, okay, that means all the lights are the same frequency, and they're also coherent, which means they have a constant phase difference. Okay, so these are the types of points I might ask you, why is it you need to use laser light if you want to accurately measure a wavelength? Okay. But also, because of their lasers, they, they're all um, monochromatic, means they produce a bright spot maxima. Okay, and we can do that, they, they're very bright at long distances, and the long distance allows us to have a low percentage uncertainty, and that is the key point we're driving at. Have you noticed how many times that's come up in these core practicals? How are we going to reduce the percentage uncertainty? Either very, very um, fine resolution, or very large thing that we measure, as large as we can make it. Okay, um, they ask the question often, if we use white light, well, what would happen differently, and why wouldn't that be accurate? Because we'd actually get a spectrum. Okay, so you'd actually have all the red um, making a maximum at one point, all the yellow, bloody blah, 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 all the green, all the blue, making a maximum at different points. So you'd actually see these spectrum rather than these individual dot maxima, and that's what we really need there. That's number eight. That's all the stuff from year 12, all the stuff from AS Physics. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the chat just briefly. I'll have a little look at the time because, um, yeah, it's 44 minutes, okay. I'm probably just going to plow on. But let's have a look at the chat because why not? Okay, so people are still talking about um, <laughs> about the different specs, yeah. Yeah, the, this isn't really. This is mainly for paper three for most things, isn't it? But they could come up in other papers as well. Um, yeah, I hope that's if this did that help, Gerpi? Did that help you understand the experiment that you never understood? I don't know, um, again, what I'll do with all this stuff, these little notes that I've made, is I will put them onto um, onto my website, along with any videos that I've made for these, and I will, um, any videos that I can find from other YouTubers as well, so you can go to these points and you can kind of go through them and look through them and make sure you memorise the right points, points of these. Um, yeah, it's the, it, there's some nice people saying thank you, it's always very good, uh, that's great. Loads of people talking about different revision channels. Obviously, A Level Physics Online is one of the most um, the, the the most used one. Um, it's got loads of past paper questions as well. On my channel, I've got really good Edexcel past paper questions because that's the one my students do. Um, I don't think there's many other people who do Edexcel past paper questions. I know that A Level Physics Online has got some really good ones for various exam boards, and also um, I find what its name now Science Shorts does CIE ones and AQA and OCR ones as well, so check them out if you want to do those. Um, hopefully the stream's nice and helpful. Yeah, there's loads of ways, remember there's loads of ways to, in most of them, there's loads of ways to manipulate the algebra into y equals mx plus c. The point is that you can do that. And normally you're trying to manipulate it so that whatever the result is, is directly the gradient. So, uh, but um, just make sure that you can do that, okay? Make sure that you can do y equals mx plus c. And basically, if it's a plus c, or if it's um, if it's not something you're going to change, you have to state that as being a control variable. Okay, I think that's about it. Is the is the 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 um, feed still pretty healthy? Everyone happy with the feed? Yeah, Lane, I'm going to stick it as I say on my website. I was going to do that just for today, but um, unfortunately. Uh, loads of things came up and um, I didn't quite get it done but I'll, I'll put it on the website with any videos that I've made I'm gonna do some hard questions from various different um, different exam boards and I'm gonna do that on Saturday okay so if you're looking for other exam boards then do that okay um, let's move on then okay on to impulse <laughs> Okay, so impulse is all about the equation Ft equals delta P, which is, in fact, Newton's second law. I hope you can see that. So this practical is really the same practical as good old F equals MA, and maybe good old 
delta p over t. Now, impulse is defined as the change in momentum, or is defined as a force times a time. So this is just accelerating a trolley. Okay, now there's two ways to do that, and importantly, you need to compensate for friction. And what we do when we're doing kinematics and we're compensating for friction, we can use standard trolleys, in which case we incline the plane slightly so that the trolley doesn't increase, doesn't accelerate as it goes down. Okay, that means that friction is equal to the component of weight in the um, direction of the trolley. Okay, um, or we can use a linear air track, and that's going to be a more common one. Okay, and we're almost always going to be using light gates for this, but again, there's different ways you can use the light gates. Okay, um, and da, 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 da. so again, you need to manipulate the algebra to give a graph with a gradient of mass, and this is the mass of the entire trolley and hanging masses and string. So normally, let's say with my linear air track, I'm going to have a string, one light gate, a distance, s. Okay, between here and here, and I'm going to measure v just here. I'm going to use v squared equals u squared plus 2as again, and this is going to be my force here with just 10 gram masses here, so it's quite a small force is all we need for this. Uh, but you could measure the you could measure initial speed here and initial speed there. You could measure a time between the two points and an s. There's loads of different ways to do this. Okay, but it tends to be the case what we're going to want is basically just the force on this axis, mass on this axis, so that A is our gradient. Oh, no, I've done that the wrong way around, sorry. Acceleration on this end, so M, the mass of the entire trolling system, is our gradient. Okay, there's loads of different ways to do that. Whatever you do, think about what you need to fix and what you need to change. In this case, we would just be changing this and plotting this graph. Now, the important thing about this practical, though, is they're asking you um, lines of worst fit. They're asking you to work out a percentage uncertainty in the gradient that you plot by doing lines of worst fit. So that's the technique that we're talking about. Uh, and what you do is you do most and least slope which fit through the error bars. Okay, so I'll just quickly sketch out what I mean by that. So if I have a graph y and x and I've got some points and those points have error bars on them. And those error bars, you can calculate them individually from like a range of repeated measures, or you can just use a kind of standard average percentage uncertainty de derived from your um, half a scale division or anything like that. And then you plot, rather than plot a line of best fit, you plot a line of worst fit with most slope, and that would be something like that. A line of worst fit with least slope, and that would be something like that. And then you can actually work out your line of best fit by um, doing the bisector of that. Now the skill isn't doing the bisector, the skill is comparing this gradient with this gradient to get a percentage difference in the gradients and you can treat that as the percentage uncertainty of your line of best fit gradient. Okay, I hope that makes sense. As a skill they could ask you to do in the exam. They'll be asking you to do all of it, they might be asking you to plot some error bars from some data, they might be asking you to do two lines of worst fit and then work out percentage difference. But they could ask you to do that, so make sure that you understand that thing. Or it might just be a comment. A student could do a percentage uncertainty of gradient by doing lines of best, um, sorry, lines of worst fit, lines of most and least slope. That's the way I like to think about it. You always remember it if you say most and least slope. Okay, um, again, there are many ways to conduct this experiment, so consider what gives you the lowest percentage of uncertainty with the apparatus available. You can do this without any light gates. You can do this by measuring a time from zero to S, basically, and you can get acceleration from that. But there, there is loads of ways to do this. Think about the, the apparatus you've got and think about what gives you the lowest percentage of uncertainty. Think about how you can increase the distance, maybe, reduce the force to give you more accuracy if you are using a stopwatch. So the timing, the length of the time is longer. Okay, you could also, this is mentioned on the sheet for this, you could do a conservation of energy experiment because you never completely get rid of friction really or air resistance as well. So you're always working and you're always gonna dissipate some heat to the surroundings if you're doing an energy transfer. Right, number 10, momentum in 2D. I really like this practical, but it's the kind of I don't think they've kind of considered this practical as well as all the other ones because there's not as many different things here. So what you do is you use video analysis and a program called Tracker. I don't know if you've ever used um, Tracker. Okay, Tracker is a bit of software that you can download for free. It's open source software. And basically what we normally do is put a ruler on either side, video from the top down, 
have a ball bearing coming in from one side, maybe down a track, so it's always got the same kind of speed. If you wanted to try and do repeats, but it's very difficult to repeat exactly the same collision, so I would just be happy to get a collision of one ball with another in two dimensions, so that we've got this one and this one going off in different directions, okay, like, like billiard balls, and we can actually measure the momentum before and the momentum afterwards, but we need to resolve these momenta into x and y dimensions. So um, I think in one of the live feeds I talked through this not, so, not that long ago, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with it now. But what you can do is you can do a closed vector triangle, okay, with the three momenta if the initial momentum of this second ball was zero. Although you could do this, it would be quite tricky with two balls coming in from different, from different sides and you can still show that momentum is always conserved in 2D. Essentially with momentum in 2D, think about working in the X dimension and the Y dimension separately. Just do your trig early, um, work out your angles like that, and then just work in X and Y just separately. Okay, you can do that, it's, it's just math really. All right, I hope that makes sense. Oh yeah, um, errors and uncertainties from this, okay, you could talk about the frame rate of the cameras. Okay, so a 60 frame per second camera is gonna have a lower percentage of uncertainty than a um, 30 frames per second camera. So ba basically the frame rate is um, is the interval of time that you're measuring. Um, also though, whenever you use a camera, um, there's a parallax error because everything is not kind of set the way it is on the camera. And I can show you that really quickly by going over to my kind of main um, camera angle. Okay, can you see see this now? Right, this is a really wide angle. Okay, this is a fisheye. So if I come out to this, my one hand will look bigger in the corner than it does in the middle. Okay, now this means fisheyes tend to make people's heads look really small in the middle um, and really skewed and large at the side. So hopefully you can kind of see that. This is not, if you look at the corner of my room, okay, then you can see that is not a directly vertical uh, image. So camera's video analysis always has a parallax error in it. So all right, back to back to the practicals. <laughs> uh, okay, and we've actually found that when we do the, when we do graphs of just one thing rolling across at a constant speed, and you use video analysis to do that, it looks like it's, it's speeding up and slowing down, and it's just because it's coming across this plane or this this conical plane of the camera angle. Okay, capacitor discharge. I think I've got a really good solution to the capacitor discharge practical, but it's not the one that they, they kind of go for. Essentially, you're charging a capacitor. And then you're discharging it through a resistor. And you're going to calculate what your expected time constant uh, to be, time constant being RC. Okay. Um, and then you're going to uh, use this to just make, basically do an exponential decay graph. You basically charge it with this side of the circuit. Normally it's shown with a little switch here, but it doesn't really matter too much. Okay, and maybe I'll put the little switch in just for completeness. Okay, and charge it on this side, discharge through this resistor, and you'll get this shape of graph, voltage against time, which I'm sure you'll recognize in exponential decay. And if you plot a log graph, then you get a straight line graph. Okay, these capacitor discharge are kind of core ideas in um, physics, so make sure that you can do the log graphs for those. Um, okay, moving on. The capacitor should be connected in series with the resistor, okay, when it's discharging. Okay, the voltmeter and, or, or the oscilloscope, now we'll talk about oscilloscope in a moment because that's where the tricky stuff comes in with these ones, has a very high resistance. So we basically put a voltmeter across the capacitor, although it would be the same thing if we put it across the resistor. Anyway, it's got a very high resistance, so it doesn't interrupt the circuit. Now, you could put an oscilloscope there, and we'll talk about that just in a little bit of time. But, but the point being, for now, they've got very high resistance, and they don't draw a current, so they don't change the rate of um, decay, the rate of discharge of the capacitor. Uh, now, this is the point. It's very difficult to measure these very small periods of time accurately. The time constant depends upon resistance and capacitance, so you can actually work out a suitable uh, time period um, a suitable length of time that this decay is going to take and um, choose a method which is appropriate to that length of time. So the way that I did it was actually just to film the voltmeter okay, and I found out the voltmeter refreshed every uh, 0.4 of a second so that was my time base in my table basically and I could just see every time it changed I just wrote down the, um, the thing from the video, just paused it, wrote down the voltage from the video and I got a really neat decay curve. Okay, The other way you could do that is you can actually um, 
repeat the experiment and look for certain potential difference. So time, firstly time to uh, 1 volt, then time to uh, 1.5 volt, then time to 2, two volts. Basically time these set um, voltages rather than time continuously and then use those points to make your decay curve. Now I found that didn't give us as much accuracy as doing it this way as well. You could use a data logger to give you a continuous set of readings. So when you're talking about data loggers, one of the advantages of data loggers is continuity. So you get a continuous graph being plotted. And it means that you don't have to look at two things simultaneously. So normally if you're timing just with a stopwatch and you're looking every kind of um, two seconds or something like that, then you have to look at the stopwatch and the voltmeter at the same point and you're never going to be able to do that accurately. So think of a way of, of changing that. Okay, and um, lastly, right, this is the one that always stumps people. You can use a square wave signal generator and an oscilloscope. And if you do that, then you the square wave looks like this, basically. On, off, on, off, on, off. And what you get if you've got a very um, low resistance, okay, or a low capacitor, capacitance is you get the charging and discharging through these points. Now, if we use our oscilloscope correctly and we trigger it, we just get this uh, curve displayed, kind of paused on the oscilloscope screen. And we can just take readings from the, the voltmeter. Voltmeter is the vertical scale and time base is the X scale on the oscilloscope. So it's a way of not, it's not really pausing what's going on, it's actually charging and discharging at a very high frequency but we can actually do the analysis of those very short times directly from the oscilloscope. So this is a really important one that they like to ask you about in the exam when it comes to capacitors. Number 12, calibrate a thermistor. It's another example of an exponential decay, and there are lots of exponential decays in A2 or in year 13. Essentially, all you're going to do is vary the temperature, so this is just going to be a case of having some water with a thermometer with your thermistor in it. And that normally we just use an ohm meter for this one. Okay, um, and you, you basically after you've done that, you're going to have to plot yourself a log graph. Okay, because it's going to it varies exponentially with temperature, the resistance of it. Okay, plot yourself a log graph to get yourself a straight line. Because whenever we are interpolating, we want to use a straight line. It's more accurate to interpolate from straight line graphs, the point they want you to understand. So we're trying to get a resistance at a certain temperature. Okay, and they, they, I think in this one they tell you 40 degrees or something like that, but they could give you any temperature they like in the exam. And you need to calibrate then a potential divider to make something come on at that given temperature. So you need to actually consider, remember, potential dividers, just sharing out voltages in the ratio of the resistances. So you need to think about what fixed resistor you need to put in a potential divider circuit to give yourself a kind of on at this point. So you need to figure out the value of R when our thermistor gives you a, a ratio R to the uh, resistance of the thermistor, a set point, so that this gives you an output of, let's say, 3 volts. Okay, They'll tell you these things, you need to be resilient enough to think about the practical and then the design of the potential divider. You can do potential dividers, they're easy. Um, all right, and then when we're talking about success of experiments, we often think about that as being a percentage difference from some true value or from estimated value. So, if you've calculated RC and you get that as being the gradient of this graph, this gradient of the graph would have a gradient one over RC minus one over RC. Um, then you have um, you have a percentage difference in your calculated one over RC to the kind of measured 1 over RC on the graph. Uh, lastly, it was very difficult to ensure the thermometer is actually reading the temperature of the thermistor rather than the water around it. So you need to give the thermistor time to reach a thermal equilibrium with the water around it. The data log is continuously reading temperature. Okay, again, that should limit that. So if you can use a data logger rather than a thermometer, you can actually continuously read the temperature as the temperature decreases and just take readings of resistance at certain points and that should give you the, uh, a bit of a reduced uncertainty due to this what we call thermal inertia that it takes a bit of time for the, um, for the thermistor to reach a certain temperature. Now this is one they decided in their wisdom to put a risk assessment in. Now I think that's a bit strange, don't you? The, a risk assessment when the only kind of um, hazard is <laughs> 
hot water, which I'd expect year sevens to be able to deal with quite safely, okay? But use physics to estimate your level of risk. You don't need to have a huge giant mass of water, so you don't need to have a huge energy, um, okay, by specific heat capacity, a huge energy to uh, potentially scold somebody. Okay, so if, you, if you're saying it's a low risk, because we've just got one beaker, maybe 200 milliliters of hot water, that is not gonna store a lot of energy. If we get a scold, we're going to put our scold under a cold tap. Okay, that, that's the one I'm talking about. When you do risk assessments in A level, it needs to be really specific. It's not we're using hot water, so we better wear goggles. And that's that's not correct even for a year seven. Okay, a little bit of chat from the um, little bit of point from the chat, and then I'll get on with the last four of the core practicals. This has been. Um, really quite quick. I hope that it's not been too rushed for you dudes. Um, if it has, say I'm going to stick these up as a, um, I'm going to stick these up as a, a website page with any videos that I've got already on them. Okay, so you can look at anything that you are not sure about. I think it's about learning those apparatus and techniques rather than thinking about just the core practicals. But if you learn all the core practicals, you'll have learned all the apparatus and techniques, you'll have thought about all the evaluative points, so you'll be fine. You'll have all the knowledge that you need to solve the problems in the exams. Right. Do short wavelengths diffract best, best through small gaps, whereas short wavelengths diffract reflect best from awesome obstacles? Not sure what you saw in my question. Uh, uh, no, I didn't see that one, buddy. I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Basically, most diffraction when um, the wavelength is equal to the gap size. Reflection shouldn't really uh, affect too much from um, obstacle size, although uh, nothing is perfectly smooth, as you know that. Okay, so... Um, Scattering is because something is not perfectly smooth. So the smoother an object, the more reflective it is, the more um, uniform the reflection is. So you get a mirrored surface and you get images in it. Parallax error, get it all in there. Did I say parallel error? And that's what you're chatting about, isn't it? That's fine. Physics is not maths, right? Physics uses maths as a tool to analyse it. Maths does help a lot with it. Okay, but it's they're not the same thing. Okay, maths, all they care about is y's and x's and z's and so on and so forth. But um, they can just describe any letter they like, whereas our letters actually mean something. So we are looking for physical constants. We're, we're using maths to prove rules for the way that things actually are. Whereas maths doesn't need any universe to occur. You know, maths is, doesn't, isn't related to the actual universe, so they're not the same thing. But Anyway, I think that's, um, I've just had a little scan through. What I normally do is I look back over all your chat after these things. So if there's anything that comes of this and you want, uh, might look good for a live feed later, um, another day, then I will have a little look at that. Somebody's chatting rubbish. Wine's laws easy peasy. Uh, yeah, good. If you're watching GCC, then that's awesome. If you're GCC, then you're watching, that's awesome. It's still going to work really well for you. Astrophysics, I used to think astrophysics was really dull, Adam, but you know, actually, like, since I've been teaching it, I've found why I kind of really love it as well. So, do all of the physics is actually interesting. There's loads to love about all of the physics, but, um, you know, it's not always going to appeal to you at any one time. I get really into a topic uh, one year and then not so into it another year. It's weird. Yeah, exactly. So ohm meter, I think I've said that. Uh, ohm meter is, uh, I wouldn't say better, it's more accurate because it doesn't cause a heating effect, so you get a more uh, close to the true value reading of a resistance. Are you defining parallax error, error for that? I defo thought you were defining parallel error. So parallax error means that there's a distance between the scale and what you're measuring. So you can avoid parallax error by having the thing you're measuring really close to the scale. Or you can avoid it by being at 90 degrees of thing, in which case it doesn't matter so much about it being a distance. So that's why analog meters actually have a mirror behind them, okay? And that means that uh, the, the, you don't use the needle, you use the reflected mirror. Useful. Yeah, large things, lower percentage of uncertainty. Thanks, Linz. <laughs> Please save me from death by astrophysics. 
Yeah, um, Mohammed, uh, could CPAC questions come in paper one or two? Yes, they could, in fact. And each paper needs to have 15% um, based on practicals. Interesting point. Um, so yes, they could. Now, they're more likely, much more likely to be on paper three. Again, the majority of them will be on paper three. But there is going to be some um, core practical questions throughout. More likely to be like, you know, what do we, what do we know from this? Um, what do we know from this practical? What, what, what uh, exact physics principle? What exact kind of um, context can we apply this practical to, rather than the actual doing of the practical? Okay, I hope that helps. That's, that's a good question. Yeah, parallax error. So one thing we actually use trigonometric parallax parallax to measure, and this is your astrophysics Adam, sorry, pa uh, we use parallax error if you like, it's called trigonometric parallax to measure the distance to quite nearby stars, okay, we can look at parallax if you hold the pen out in front of you, you've probably done this, and you close one eye and the other, okay, um, you obviously can't see that, but if you do that you'll see the pen appears to move relative to the background behind it, okay, and that's because of the different angle from uh, different eyes, so yeah, um, that, that is an example of parallax. The parallax error is because you're reading a scale with a distance between them or you're not at 90 degrees to the scale. Okay, so I'm going to go back on for the last four core practicals now. I hope that was helpful to you all. I actually really like the way they've done this specific latent heat practical here. Basically, it goes like this crush the mice and melt it, measure the masses, starting temperatures, and final temperatures, and then write an equation which equates the energy to melt the ice with the energy to lower the temperature of the water and raise the temperature of the now melted ice. So, um, I hope that makes sense. You basically start with a beaker filled with some water, roughly at room temperature. You take some ice and you crush it, and you do that in a funnel. You do that in a funnel so that the ice is already melting but we've allowed the water to drip off so it's just ice that goes into the beaker so then I got in our crushed ice goes okay with any drips there and we do all this on the top pan balance so that we get a kind of reading of the kind of mass of the water mass of the water plus the ice and that tells us the, the mass of the ice and we measure the starting temperature and the final temperature and we know that the starting temperature of this is zero degrees because it's an ice and water mixture. And then we write an equation which equates the energy to melt the ice, call that E ice, which is equal to the energy to raise the temperature of the water plus the energy to, sorry, to lower the temperature of the water plus the energy to um, raise the temperature of the now melted ice. Okay, I'm going to call that BWI or something like that, I don't really know. Um, again, I've got a video where I go through all this, so I probably won't go do the algebra right now, but this is a latent heat, and these are two specific heat capacities. Okay, so um, that's where this all comes from. Okay, the mass of the ice, the starting temperature of the water, the final temperature of the water, and zero degrees Celsius is all you really need to do this. Okay, um, this is a point though, as you're finding a temperature difference by subtracting one temperature from another, you add the uncertainty. So this is the point they're trying to make here. Now this is a point a lot of people have discussed, what about with a ruler, you're measuring from one end and the other end. So is it um, half a scale division or is it one full scale division? I think with a ruler we'd normally say it's just still half a scale division, especially if you fixed it down. But with this temperature difference you're actually measuring twice. You're measuring temperatures twice and you're using them to calculate a change in temperature so you've got the uncertainty um, added together. Now they're the same um, variable so you can, um, the same variable, same quantity so you can just add the absolute uncertainties and normally when you compound errors you have to add the percentage uncertainties but in that case you can just add the uncertainties, the absolute uncertainties. So you get a total uncertainty of one degree rather than a half. So look out for ideas like that, it's a pretty tricky one. Um, the ice should be crushed so it melts quickly and this limits the time during which it is melting. Okay, so um, I hope that makes sense because what's going to happen is you're also getting some heat transferred to the ice and water mixture from the surroundings. So if we do this as quickly as possible, we limit the amount of heat which is going in from the surroundings. Okay, um, and this is where we're getting a systematic error from in this, which is uh, heating from the surroundings okay um, and this causes a smaller than accurate value so again if you know you've got a systematic error a systematic error think of how that affects your final result now in this case it means the latent heat's a bit smaller than it should be 
Right, Boyle's Law. Now, why on earth they included this as a core practical, I do not know, because this is like all of two minutes. You've probably got this just set up in your lab. It looks something like this. You've got a tube um, with a scale behind it and a kind of trapped mass of gas. That's the gas in there. And on that, you've got a volume scale and you've got a, a pressure gauge here and a little pump. And you just simply put it under pressure and you measure the volume of this and you find that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Okay, um, easy practical, easiest one in the world. Now this is an important one though because you've got an analog scale on your pressure gauge so it's about interpolating between scale markings. Now analog is not necessarily not as good as uh, digital, okay, they, they, they have both have benefits. We normally use digital scales these days, but actually in this case, a digital scale will be fluctuating quite a lot. So actually the analog scale is a bit more fixed and a bit more easy just to interpolate um, a reading from the analog scale rather than looking at the random error of this fluctuating digital reading. So that's a really useful thing. Um, you have got this problem in controlling the temperature because as you know for an ideal gas it needs to be a fixed mass of gas and temperature affects both of these things as well um, so you need to control temperature and that's a difficult thing to do because you do work on this gas so you cause its internal energy and therefore its temperature to rise okay the volume is made off the analog scale so here is the parallax error that we were just chatting about okay so you have to be 90 degrees to scale and as close to the scale as possible okay so that's the statement to make really if you if you recognize parallax error it's going to be a two marker state uh, one thing that the student should be careful to do when reading the volume from this scale. They need to have the, the tube as close as possible to the scale and they need to read off from 90 degrees to the scale to avoid parallax error. Okay, It's going to be a simple statement like that if you just memorise all of these improvements. Okay, number 15 and the penultimate one, absorption of gamma ray through lead. It's another example of an exponential decay. If we have thickness down here and we have not activity but counts per second here, um, then we'll get an exponential um, graph like this. So again, we can plot log of counts um, versus thickness and get a straight line graph, and we can actually work out a decay constant for this situation here, for the, uh, the rate of absorption through lead. Now this is a really important one for risk assessments here. Okay? There's two risks involved with using radiation, which is ir irradiation and contamination. Now they're different. This means being hit by some radioactive particles, alpha, beta, or gamma, this means that you've actually got some relative stuff on you. Now this is much more of an issue if this happens than if this happens, because this happens to us all day anyway by background radiation. So avoiding this one is really important. And again, it's not just about using blooming goggles when you do this, okay? because actually these are sealed sources, so they're unlikely to do any contamination. You might want to wear gloves, but it's much more, a much more sensible thing is to use a long pair of tongs, like 10 centimetres, or to say, uh, once you take started your experiment, move two metres away, because if you move um, two metres away, uh, or you double the distance between you and a gamma emitter, then you've quartered the actual intensity of the dose, So because it's by inverse square law. So you, again, use the physics to make the um, risk assessment. You can limit irradiation massively by limiting the time that you use these for and by maximizing the distance that you are from them. Okay. And remember, here's another example of, an, uh, of a random um, uncertainty. So how do we deal with random ones? We do repeats or we measure for a longer period of time to calculate an average. Okay. Um, so whenever you're talking about random, you repeat, you look for anomalies, you calculate a mean. And also measuring thickness of the lead that you're using, that again is going to have a random uncertainty. So you measure thicknesses, at least five places, average, and use a micrometer, so your percentage of uncertainty is as low as possible. Now there is this point as well, some GM tubes measure a cumulative count, and you have to turn that into a counts per second. Well you can do this with just with a counts, you know, over two minutes or something like that, it doesn't really matter. Again, use large periods of time to reduce percentage uncertainty. Some um, Geiger Miller tubes, though, they, they actually work at a count rate per second. Now, it depends on how active your source is. You're not going, if, if you only get um, 100 counts per minute with the source that you've got, then it's not appropriate to use something that measures counts per second. It's not going to be an accurate um, measurement. Last one then, the mass spring system. And then I'm just going to briefly talk about designing practicals, and then that'll be me. One last look at the um, one last look at the chat. Okay, basically here what you do is you set up some kind of, um, you normally clamp it down to the table for safety reasons, set up some kind of mass spring system, literally just a spring with a mass on it. 
okay and you vary that mass on a little mass hanger okay and you measure the time period and you can use that the graph that you get to work out the mass of an unknown mass this is how we measure mass of astronauts in space where the where normal uh, balances don't work so uh, here's how we, we do that okay use multiple oscillations so time 10 full swings and divide by 10 and this is an accurate way of using a stopwatch to measure a very short time period and you should also use what you call a fiducial marker it's a really important one to remember okay it's a timing mark or um, you know a mark to help you see exactly you're measuring from the same place within the oscillation so you'd have a fiducial marker set at the equilibrium position before you start it and that would allow you to make sure that you time 10 full swings and you stop when it comes back to that equilibrium position for the 10th, oh no, for, it's going to go for the equilibrium position 20 times, isn't it? But it goes back up to the equilibrium position tenth, the 10th time it's done that, the 10th full cycle. Okay, so um, what other way you could do this, okay, you could use an ultrasound position sensor, okay, to actually put that underneath here. And the UPS will measure continuously by a pulse echo technique a sine wave, right? And that would be displayed on your computer. And again, you could actually use 10 full cycles or however many full cycles you've got and divide that by how many you've got. And you get a really accurate way of measuring, well, this would be the time period of one full oscillation. Or if you didn't like that, you could actually set a light gate up um, and it would break the beam um, every time it passed through and you'd know then it breaks the beam twice in every full cycle and that will give you an accurate way of doing it as well and most light gates the software has a method they call it a pendulum method normally a pendulum method of timing to allow you to do that, to do that. so you can use the graph to actually do a more accurate time period they like to ask you to do that one in the exam as well and this is an example of a free oscillation not a forced one a forced one wouldn't be appropriate as we're looking to find a natural frequency you could use a forced one but then you would be looking for that natural frequency and that adds more i think more uncertainty into your experiment rather than just allowing it to resonate allowing it to go as natural frequency so it's also an example of a lightly damped oscillation and I normally extend this into damping as well and this means energy leaves the system as each swing heats up the surroundings. So last little look at the chat and then just um, what to remember when you're asked to design your own practicals. Okay, I hope this has been really useful for you. It's a bit, so I've gone through that really quick. How long will that all take me? An hour and 20 minutes, okay, so... Um, that's been quite a long one. But it's great to see you all sort of hanging out for the for that period of time. I hope it's useful for you. What's coming up in the next few days, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna to look at some exemplars and talk about how to decode um, how to decode longer written exam questions and how to look for clues. Uh, th those exemplars are gonna have some common errors and how you can make sure you get marks that you deserve. And I think that's really, really good. Um, and then on Saturday I'm going to do some of the hardest questions that are going to come up on paper one and I won't just look at Excel for that, I'll look at some other exam boards as well. I've seen a lot of people requesting Educast so I'll probably do a few of those. Um, OCR, AQA I think are, and CIE are really well done by Science Shorts and by A Level Physics Online so I probably won't do any of those. Okay there's some good chat going on but it's not really questions for me which is fine. Yeah learn the content, do the past papers, okay, the content helps you solve the um, solve the problems in the paper. Yeah, I'll upload all these to the page here, yeah, spend a bit of time on these, okay. I'm also, I'm going to develop them in the future, so I don't know if any of you are in AS, but I'll be developing this kind of document to allow you to um, use it in the future, but if you're ready for the exam, it's not going to be done for that. Yeah, I've got some, there is a practicals playlist as well, so there's a, on my uh, site, if you look at the A-level part, you'll see key practicals, core practicals, with ones like that. I know that if you go onto A-level physics online website, you will find loads of run-throughs of core practicals as well, they're really, really good. All right, I hope that's been useful, and let's just talk about, oh yeah, somebody mentioned fasting, I talked about fasting the other day, and um, I know you guys are doing the right thing, that's difficult um, to have an exam period during Ramadan, I hope it's going okay. I think you need to manage your energy um, really well. Um, there's a point as well, um, 
that uh, Mr. Um, Mahmood uh, said, and in my last live feed I recommended his video, which talks about how to study and how to do the exams during that, that period as well. And it's about making sure you eat healthy, but eating carbs to give you that energy as well. And I think you just need to make sure you have a nap as um, often as you can, okay, after kind of school time. And if you keep to, all of you, if you keep to kind of school time during this half term, then you won't have to change your routine again. I don't know about when, when I was a, a teenager, okay, um, every single holiday I'd sleep until two in the afternoon and then I'd, when I went to school I'd have to really change my routine. So that's not that's not a good idea really, it's not the best thing to do. Um, so do, <laughs> do kind of keep to a school routine and actually if you're doing Ramadan at the minute then sleep maybe from four till seven, get up and study a little bit before Iftar, have your lovely meal with your fa family and friends and then study again after that okay and then get your, get your sleep and then obviously you're going to wake up really early to have your, your breakfast um, uh, and study after that before school session okay so that's the way of doing that okay all the best for doing that. There, there was a really, really interesting article I want to talk about which talked about um, Exam results in America, and I guess this is the same pattern in, in the UK, um, actually go down during really hot periods. And we're having quite a hot summer so far, okay? So actually, you'd expect exam results to be slightly lower. And I was just thinking, that for me, guys and girls, is a um, is an opportunity to work that a little bit harder than my fellow student, okay? So so think about it like that. If exam results are going to be slightly lower across the country, then use, this, use that as an opportunity to get that extra study in and do that a little bit better than the rest, because that's how your grades are determined, okay, from your... Um, from your, that's how your grades are determined from how your peers did basically. All right, just talk about designing the practicals and then one or two other things and then we're done. Okay, so um, this is my kind of uh, tip. Okay, when designing your own practicals, make sure that you identify the variables that you're going to measure clearly. Okay, so um, include as well the apparatus. That's what people forget to do. They say, they say something like measure the length and presume that we know that you'd use a meter ruler to measure that length. We do know that as examiners, but tell us that you know it. Okay, it's about you showing that. Okay, and why is it that a meter ruler with a millimeter scale is the appropriate instrument to measure that 10 centimeter or 50 centimeter length? Okay, so state why. Um, ensure that you really clearly state what you change, what you measure, and what you keep the same. Okay, and that comes from the algebra. So if you think about the algebra and you think about manipulating it into y equals mx plus c, you can think about what you need to change, what you need to measure, and what you need to keep the same. What's your constants? Give evaluative points. And the evaluative points, it's not completely exhaustive, but it's pretty close. Are the evaluative points I've just gone through in this video? Okay, they're not going to ask you to come up with your own evaluative points, but they will state, suggest something that you could do to ensure this was accurate. Okay, now the answer to that is going to be one of the evaluative points from one of these core practicals. So blooming well, make sure that you learn all these evaluative points really, really well. Okay, and then you get them into your own design of a practical. And then think about plotting a graph. Ensure you indicate what graphs you would draw. Okay, where possible, resolve something into y equals mx plus c and state what the gradient represents or state how you would use a gradient to calculate whatever the target kind of data was. And lastly, always be thinking about ways to reduce the percentage uncertainty. And the percentage uncertainty can be reduced by increasing the size of what you're trying to measure or, re or increasing the resolution, so a smaller set of scale divisions, a smaller uncertainty on your instrument. Okay, so do think that is one of the key things they drive at in these questions about practicals is reducing percentage uncertainty. I really hope that was useful for you, for you all. There's some things that um, came up, and I might do some live feeds on these. I probably won't do these right now, okay? Um, uh, the, from the last chat, but I'll just, I'll maybe I'll pin them in as small elements in my next live feed, okay? I'm gonna talk about longer written questions on um, tomorrow, okay? So that's that's coming on Saturday. These were suggested in in the live chat from previous videos. Somebody suggested exam solutions on YouTube, and that was really good for maths. So if you're a math student, I've seen a lot of you chatting about maths exams coming up as well. So exam solutions are really good if you haven't found that. Loads and loads and loads of exam solutions as you'd expect um, on that thing there. Bloom's taxonomy, okay, I might well do a command words um, video. But I've talked a lot in previous videos and live feeds about Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, it starts from basically remembering. And remembering is easy. Understanding is a little bit harder. 
Now applying your understanding is harder still. And really this is the baseline, this is the E grade on a um, A level paper. All right. If you can't really understand, if you can't really apply your knowledge to your knowledge and understanding to a situation, you're going to struggle to really pass that. Okay. Almost all of a A level paper is analytical. Okay, and that's where maybe where that C grade comes in. But actually um, evaluating, where all of pretty much all of what I've talked about today is about evaluating practicals. Um, making comparisons, okay, stating why something is better than another thing, okay, with you know all of these things done beneath it, so in an analytical way, um, is a really hard skill. And lastly, creating is a really hard skill, and that's where your A kind of A star level is. Right, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, maybe E's down here, right? But um, the point is, these are the hardest skills. So when it says something like design a practical, it's actually one of the hardest skills but you all you have to do to design a practical is remember all of the evaluative points from the core practicals so if you bother to sit and watch this video which some of you have and some some of you guys will be coming back to watch this um, recorded then you're going to hopefully remember those evaluative points you're going to hopefully remember the skills of measuring some things you're going to be able to apply them to the context that they've given you the experiment they've asked you to design and you're going to be able to therefore produce an evaluative response and create a really good practical so all of these skills are increasing difficulty but they rely on the ones below it i hope that makes sense to you all um, last thing suggests good physics book and people have been talking about the difference in CGP, the Hodder or the Collins revision guide. Votes right now, which one do you think is best? Because I'm not sure. I really don't like CGP, but it's a necessary evil. But my favourite books are Physics for You and um, uh, the actual SHAP books for the Edexcel, the Salters Horners books for Edexcel. So um, I've actually put, I've made some videos on how good I think they are. So they are in my channel somewhere. And also on my website, there's a page where you can buy some textbooks. And uh, they are what you call affiliate links. So it gives me a tiny bit of money when you do that. All right. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll go on and I'll have a quick look at the chat and then I'm finished. <laughs> Can you be a C student in maths but be good at physics? Definitely. I mean, there are people who get A stars in, in physics every year and don't do maths, so yeah, definitely. I think yeah, the kind of the skills that we use in um, A level uh, math skills aren't the difficult math skills really. They're just some of the kind of core math skills, really the important math skills. Yes, I think you should do um, past papers from the old topics because A level physics doesn't change that much into the new ones. Glad you've enjoyed that, Lindsay. Educast. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll do some of the Educast ones then. Thanks, Mariam. It's great to have you watching. Glad that's helpful for you all. Adam as well. It's great to see you here. Newton's gravitational law. Similar is difference between radial fields and yeah. So yeah, um, if you take apart some algebra, there's some there's some equations that look really really similar, and the, the fields equations and the capacitor discharge and the radioactive decay, the exponential decay equations are all basically the same. So the hard questions they ask are actually comparing those different equations. So all the stuff for fields can be compared to all the stuff for um, all this all the stuff. For the other field, if that makes sense, you can compare magnetic fields with gravitational fields, with electro uh, electric fields, with magnetic fields, etc. And similarly, with the different decays, you can compare the different decays. They all fall into the same uh, basic form. That's it. That's my job, Jazz. <laughs> Thanks a lot for watching. I will be back. I will be back tomorrow um, for some of the hardest questions. Um, I will see you then.